Hello, everybody. I'm James Conlon, and it's time for Coffee with Conlon again, yet again. Uh, I brought my uh, coffee cup here. It's slightly color-coordinated, as this is a dark blue shirt. This is a brighter blue. So enjoy your coffee, if you will. Uh, we have some really good questions today, so I will start. Uh, and this is from my wonderful colleague, Mark Lyons, uh, at Los Angeles Opera. The Anonymous Lover hasn't been performed in centuries, and it hasn't been recorded. For an opera like that, before your first rehearsal with the cast and orchestra, what do you do to prepare to conduct music that you've never heard before? Uh, thanks for the question. By the way, I should explain to everybody that that's the name, that's the translation of the name of an opera by a man named Joseph Boulogne Chevalier de Saint-Georges. That's a very long name. And he was a black composer who was roughly a contemporary of Mozart's. In fact, he was 10 years older. We know that Mozart and he lived under the same roof. We know that he went to uh, the Esterhazy uh, castle to uh, to commission Joseph Haydn to write six symphonies which have and he conducted the premiere and they are now known as the Paris symphonies so he was a very well-known man uh, a violinist a conductor and by the way a champion fencer so um, he wrote six operas only one of them has been found he was very successful at the time but his music disappeared from uh, from performances, and we are only going to as assume that this is uh, this is another example of of racism, blatant racism, on the part of uh, just about everybody. Now, I must uh, confess to my ignorance; I did not know about him until uh, until recently, and I'm very happy that I, I know about him now. Uh, this opera is beautiful. And I would say that if you didn't know what it was or what it wasn't, you could certainly think it was early Mozart. Beautiful music, and we are going to be streaming it on November the 14th. So I hope everybody will take an interest, not just in our streaming, but in uh, this composer. Now for Mark's question, so familiarize you, you start... Um, as I always do with the score, and I just look at it and look at it and look at it until some of it starts to make sense to me, get an idea of the overall arc, definitely read the uh, text of the libretto over and over again. This opera has dialogues and music, so there's a lot of text. Um, so I like to sit at the piano and play some of it. But the fact is that music exists in sound. And so it isn't really until you start rehearsing that you have a, a stronger profile of how you feel and what you think about it. So that's about to happen. And I'm very excited about that. Very excited about this performance. And uh, thank you for the question. So now this is from Edward uh, Hakobjanyan. He says, if Verdi was alive, what is the one question you would ask him? Well, Edward, first of all, I wouldn't know what to do with myself. I, I, would, I would keep him there until as long as I could ask him just about everything. Can't do that, of course. So I had to choose one. In order to answer your question, I had to choose one thing I would like to ask him. is about one of the, if not the most important, unrealized projects that Verdi had was to write an opera to King Lear of Shakespeare. And I would love to know from him how he would have first, it so, first it selected out the material that he was going to use, because every composer has to do that in shortening a, uh, a dramatic work. Who would the characters be? Which ones? I mean, it's obviously there'd be King Lear, there'd be his daughters, but what would their voice types be? Would, who would be the baritone? Who would be the soprano and the mezzo-soprano? Mezzo how would all that, would he have, uh, how would he have constructed the opera? So those are all questions. Now, we, we know that he started to sketch it I think back in the 1860s, 1850s or 1860s, but uh, it never came to, re uh, to realization. And that's a big frustration for all 
opera fans and Verdi fans and, and opera Shakespeare fans. The other composer who wanted to write King Lear and unfortunately never did also was Benjamin Britten. So King Lear is, well, now there have been operas on King Lear, but that's what I would like to ask uh, Giuseppe Verdi. Now here's a, 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 a short question from, uh, this is a, looks like an Instagram, uh, Alto Harlequin. What advice do you have for a beginning conductor? Well, that's a hard, hard, hard question uh, because, um, you know, it depends on the individual, depends on what's your stage of development. Uh, I would suggest to any young person that if they want to conduct, they want to be a conductor, master an instrument uh, of some sort. And that the musical mastery that's going to come from that is going to be the basis of you becoming um, the good musician you need to become as a conductor. Now, the only thing I can only way of, uh, because I also don't know, know your age, the only thing I could do is to recall my own ch childhood because it is a question that was uh, pretty important to me at a certain point. I had decided by the age of 13 that I wanted to conduct. And you can't study conducting at the age of 13. You can't study conducting until, um, as I say, you've at least uh, you have an, an instrument. And so I, of course, studied my piano very hard. I also played the violin for a few, a, a few years, more, more to familiarize myself with it. Um, I coached singers. I accompanied a chorus. Anything that would make me, uh, you know, give me, give, give me the kind of knowledge that I was going to need later subsequently. Having grown up in New York City, which was a great fortune for me, I could go to a lot of concerts regularly and see uh, great conductors, um, okay conductors, mediocre conductors, bad conductors. I could see a lot of conductors. So one can intuit something and learn something from watching people and hearing performances. So I wasn't 18 until I actually had a conduct conducting lesson. But uh, those are the kind of things that you can at least, if you're young and you want to get started, think of all those things. I, I can only draw from my own experience. Every, every conductor is different and every conductor's story is different. And so not so easy to answer to you. But now here's a fellow Juilliard student, uh, Jean Hartman. She asks, what, what's your funniest memory from your days at Juilliard? Well, thank you for that, Jean. Uh, Julia, of course, was where I studied from the age of 18 to 22. It was also, it was also I, I guess, what was my college education at the same time. I was a conducting major there. I really had to really think about this question, Gene, because <clears throat> Juilliard wasn't a particularly funny place. I, I remember being very intense, very serious, uh, a sort of uh, nerd, uh, egghead, a, don't remember lots of laughs and fun and funny things, so it's a little bit a little bit uh, difficult to answer answer that question. But I did think of one story that stands out. I, I I have told it many times over the years, and so it it passes for funny. And I think that given that we you are all an opera audience, you might enjoy this one just to show you how right or wrong people can be about assessing talent. I would say in about 1973, I had to conduct La Boheme at the Juilliard School because after I graduated, I, I went on to the faculty. And there was a production of La Boheme, it was first performed in 1972, actually the second time in 1974. And we were auditioning singers and auditioning tenors and weren't too happy with the tenors, as is often the case. And so uh, there was a, a man there who was passed away many years ago, uh, told me, he said, well, there's this guy here, but you're really not going to like him. I mean, he's just, he's just a disaster. He's, you know, he has a good voice, but he's undisciplined and he's not a good musician. And I don't think he will learn anything. So I, I don't, I mean, I don't think you should waste your time listening. And I said, well, look, let's, let's, let's try it out. I'll go down there and I'll work with him for, at the piano for a half an hour, 45 minutes, and I'll 
Trump back and tell you what I think. He said, well, you're going to waste your time. I said, okay, no, don't have anything else to do with that time right now. That's as important. So I went down to, to the practice studio and uh, this guy was there and he took off his shirt and started singing in his undershirt and walking around the piano while he sung and gesticulating. And I was playing and thinking to myself, this is a great voice. This is a really great voice. This is an amazing voice. So I went back. I said, I, I asked him, Sir, well, let's take a break. And I went up to this, the office of the man who had said to me, and I said, uh, I want him. Let's take him. He said, oh, no, it's really not going to work out. You're going to really regret it. I said, I swear I'm not going to regret it. And we're all going to have a big success with him. And I predict that he's going to have a great career. Well, you're wrong, but if you insist, uh, we'll try it. And so that tenor, I know you're dying to know, was Neil Shikoff, who went on to be internationally one of the great tenors of our time. And uh, I was very happy to be right. I was wrong on a lot of occasions, but I was right on that occasion. Of course, he had a great success. And then, of course, he went on um, for 30, 40 years to, uh, to have a great and wonderful professional life gave a lot of people enjoyment. So, Gene, that's the funniest thing I could think of. So here's uh, Lynn Mullins. How do you communicate with the prompter during a performance? I'm very happy to have a, que have a question about the prompter because a lot of people don't know what a prompter does. A lot of people don't even know that there, there is often a prompter in the opera house. And and the third part of I'm going to answer is a question you didn't ask, but I, will, I want this is one I want to address anyway, is that there has been a growing uh, intolerance of prompters in recent years on the part of uh, stage directors. And I'd like to address that. So first of all, while you're conducting a performance on the podium, I can't communicate with the prompter. Now, the prompter... Uh, nowadays has a monitors, you know, that can look at a screen and can see everything I'm doing. So the prompter has all of that information and he or she is passing that on to the stage. And they have two functions, at least two functions. The first function and the original function of prompting was to remind people of their text. And so they have to have a very good technique of just being able to suggest the beginning of a line and then get out of the way. Uh, that was the original intent, but prompters become like a second conductor. Uh, they can cue people, they can say, wait, you're ahead of, you've gotten ahead, or you have, or hurry up, you're behind the beat. A, a prompter can act like a conductor. And why is that helpful to the, the main conductor? And the answer is, not everybody can, not all singers can see the conductor well from where they are. It depends on the angle uh, that they're standing, depends are they looking away from the conductor, are they looking sideways? And so very often that is the case. And then bear in mind, the, the principal conductor is pretty busy with a lot of things to do. First of all, you have to concentrate on keeping the orchestra not just together with itself, but together with the cast, or put uh, conversely, making sure the singers are staying with the conductor, with making sure the chorus is with uh, the sound of the orchestra. That's a pretty big job. And so there's a lot to do. And so you can't necessarily be available to every person on that stage. Uh, what's more, it's very, uh, it's very difficult, if possible at all, to prompt a singer who's forgetting their lines. I mean, you can't shout out across a, an orchestra on a stage. So uh, the prompter is also helping out in those situations. And I would also say during rehearsals, it helps uh, keep the tempo and the speed uh, of the rehearsal in place by being able to quickly identify when you stop, where the conductor stops, and when we're going to restart. Uh, the prompter can help the singer say, we're starting at such and such a line, and they'll say the line, or they'll 
yeah, because we use very often number system. We'll say, well, we're going to start 10 bars before letter A. Well, who knows what that is unless you're looking at the music. So that's another function of the prompt. And then the most important uh, thing that people don't realize, and that is in a performance when somebody gets sick and you have to bring somebody in from another city at the last minute or who hasn't rehearsed, you really need that prompter to help. Now, this doesn't happen, it just doesn't happen that often. In, we've been lucky in Los Angeles, we've rarely had those situations, but they're pretty, pretty normal standard. The Metropolitan Opera has a whole system of cover artists who are there and rehearse and have seen the whole production just to walk on. That's because America is big and you can't fly people around quickly. Whereas it, as in Europe, and I was a music director both at the Paris Opera and at the Cologne Opera in Germany, if you know by 11 o'clock in the morning that someone's not going to sing, you call up all the other opera houses and you find somebody who knows the rule. If they arrive, as they often do, the end of the day, at the end of the afternoon, there's not enough time to even rehearse. I mean, I've had singers arrive at uh, 7 o'clock for a 7.30 rehearsal and the, for a 7.30 performance. And the first and most important thing that's going to happen is that they have to get their costume fitting. So sometimes I have either just gone into the dressing room to greet the person and say good luck and thank you for coming. And then on the other hand, uh, sometimes you might have a moment or two to agree about uh, a few breaths. But sometimes that singer who arrives hasn't sung that particular role, let's say in a few years, then the prompter is again very useful. And the prompter also can generally give stage directions to those singers, remind them where to go, where to stand, who to move against. The prompter is a very underrated a member of the musical community in an opera house. And then I have to say, to give due diligence, uh, a, uh, an argument that, with which I do not agree at all, but I do have to state it because uh, the stage directors and producers in modern decades have taken a position against prompters. Uh, they feel that there's, there are no prompters in the legitimate legitimate theater you don't everybody knows their lines and rehearses them to the point where nobody forgets and nobody can get into trouble they feel that a prompter's box distracts the eye for people in the audience there are also attitudes as in well great artists don't need a prompter it's only for second rate artists so if you want to be a great artist you have to not have a prompter now, I'm repeating those because they are arguments. Um, I don't agree with them, and I don't agree with them for many reasons. I feel absolutely in the, um, the legitimacy and the importance of prompters actually to be actually helping, uh, the, actually helping the dramatic element as well. When singers feel secure and they know that they have a helping hand nearby, they are able to throw themselves into their roles more completely. That at least is my experience. And I'd also like to say to any of those directors who usually leave after opening night, if you've ever been in an opera company, as I have been, I'm repeating, Paris and Cologne, where you do a string of 12 performances and at the eighth performance, uh, somebody gets sick and you have a, a replacement. And then the next time the singer is still sick, but the replacement can't come and you get another one. And maybe you'll get a third one. That's when the prompter is absolutely uh, not a luxury, but a necessity. So that's a long answer, uh, Lynn, to your question. Uh, I can't communicate with the prompter, but I can certainly uh, advocate and praise the role of good prompters. Okay, uh, this is from George uh, Abe, or Abe, I'm not sure how to pronounce your last name. Was there ever a time when the role of Cherubino was sung by a male, either tenor or contra? After all, he, she is a young man. I love the mezzos who sing it, but I am wondering if ever a male singer has ever had this part. 
Now, I should say for those of you, uh, Cherubino is, of course, a character and a very beloved character in Mozart's The Marriage of Figaro. Uh, he is a young man, and he's an amorous young man, and he's, uh, he's, he falls in love easily, quickly, and um, with several people often at one time. So that's his charm. He's charming because he's a teenager. It's not so charming when, uh, when Mozart's characters get to be adults and act like that, as in Don Giovanni, not charming at all. Um, but Carabino is a very special case, and he's, the, he's not the first of a genre, but, uh, but he will have an influence on the, on the subsequent composers. Uh, I should also start by saying that at the beginning of operas, there were lots of uh, uh, countertenors, uh, uh, castrati, these were the men who had had biological operation as, as young teenagers and their voices remained high, and they were common throughout the 17th and the 18th century. In fact, there are sometimes that they sang women's roles as well. But this is, this is the opposite. This is a woman singing a male role. Was this Mozart's idea? Well, no. It was actually the idea of Beaumarchais, the, uh, the playwright of The Marriage of Figaro. He wanted Carabino to be played by a young woman, and so he had that done. So I think Mozart took it directly from Beaumarchais. And then he and his uh, librettist, uh, Lorenzo da Ponte, set Carabino's to, uh, to usually what we considered an, an alto or a mezzo-soprano. Now, historically, have countertenors sung it? Yes, that is happening from time to time. Is it good or is it bad? Well, it's good if the countertenor is good, and it's bad if the countertenor is not, is not good. It's bad, it's bad quality, if, you know, but that depends on the singer. So I don't rule it out. Uh, absolutely. It was clearly not Mozart's intention. So I think one has to take that into consideration when you're making decisions like this. I am also assuming that Mozart could have done that if he had wanted to. So I myself prefer Aaron Carabino sung by a mezzo-soprano or an alto. But uh, I admit that it is a possibility uh, with a very, very good countertenor, male alto, be what, be what it is. It is a possibility, and it's a, it, uh, it's certainly in a dramatic way, it is good. But that countertenor has to look like a young boy. So that's, an, uh, that's another necessity. So thanks for that great question, George. Here's a, here's a question from another one of uh, my colleagues at Los Angeles Opera, uh, Claire Pigram. Thank you, Claire, for this. Um, and this is, a, this is a great one. In, it's in Time for Halloween, which is shortly, what is Maestro's favorite spooky opera? Well, in order to answer that question, I mean, one just popped into my head, and I'll tell you what that is at the end. But so I, I, I sat down, I wrote, wrote down as many operas that have ghosts or ghouls or people coming from the supernatural uh, and there's a lot of them and they they start in the baroque um, or orfeo monteverdi's orfeo already uh, has has the ghosts so to speak uh, and that was also true for a lot of that century uh, sometimes it's funny orpheus has also orpheus has been as you know including at la opera has been written so many operas maybe m more than any other subject but then you have funny ones like orpheus in the underworld by offenbach which is a, of course a comic opera uh devils i could think of um at least two russian operas uh, the fiery angel by prokofiev where there's a ghost uh, and Rubinstein's The Demon. These are important operas where there are ghosts who appear. Uh, now, witches. Uh, witches are a big, big favorite, especially at Halloween. The first thing that always comes to my mind is uh, Verdi's Macbeth with its chorus of witches. And also Ernest Bloch uh, wrote an opera of Macbeth, which has soloist witches. Then... I could find two 
two cases that I could remember. One was Purcell's Dido and Aeneas has, a, has an excerpt in Giazzone by Cavalli, very early opera, has witches. And in a comic strain, Verdi himself has witches, goblins, but they're not really witches and goblins. They're the last act of Falstaff. All, all the children and some of the adults of the, of the town of Windsor dress up to uh, s- surprise and torture Falstaff in the uh, last act. Of course, it's all c- comedy. It's all fun, but they are witches too. Very frightening witch or ghost, ghost, not a witch. The Queen of Spades, the Countess who has died at the hands or at least provoked by the protagonist, uh, German, has died and she's going to reappear to him in his dreams. There's a ghost in Die Tote Stadt by uh, Eric Wolfgang Korngold. And then there's an opera called, and we produced it at LA Opera, The Ghosts of Versailles. That's a wonderful work, which is also based on Beaumarchais, and it would be the final part of his trilogy of works, of which I've made some podcasts, and you're welcome to find them here on our website. There was a third opera to the Figaro trilogy. It was called The Guilty Mother, La Mère Coupable. And as a basis, John Corigliano wrote an opera, but he, he used it only as a starting point. And the story recounts uh, all of the ghosts around the time of Beaumarchais, including Marie Antoinette, and a whole story is told on the plane of ghosts. Uh, it's a wonderful and delightful opera, and also a very, very touching, very moving opera. Some people consider the commendatore who comes in in the last scene of Don Giovanni to take, first to give Don Giovanni the opportunity to repent, and then he comes in and he basically drags him down to his fiery punishment, well-deserved, in hell. There's a ship full of ghosts. It's the Flying Dutchman. They've been out on the seas for centuries, and uh, we don't actually see them, but we hear from them. And they're a, they're a frightening lot And when they, when they uh, make, so to speak, an appearance, not a real appearance, but we hear them in the final scene of Wagner's The Flying Dutchman. Now, let's see if I've got them all. I'm saving my most frightening one till last. Um, oh, I forgot, Der Freischutz also has the, the scene in Wolf's Glen. It's another, another, another scene. So what is the, Claire's original question was, what's my favorite spooky opera? And far and away, I think the answer would be The Turn of the Screw by Benjamin Britten. There's a pair of ghosts in that opera who sing and who uh, inhabit the spirit and the souls of two young children. It is a frightening, pretty frightening, dark and dank opera, but one that is uh, a masterpiece. And I'm very happy that uh, we were able to perform it as a part of our uh, salute to Britain on the 100th anniversary of his birth. Britain, a story by Henry James, uh, worth, well worth reading, although hard to read. But that is the opera, I think, where, the, where characters from another world, a ghost world, are the most real, the most immediate, and in their way, the most frightening. So thank you, Claire, for that, and thank you to all of you. Great questions this time, and I hope that I was able to answer them adequately. I will look forward to seeing you all again at Coffee with Conlon.